All right, well, let's do this. I'm not sure if other people will be coming by, but that's okay. So last time we talked a little bit about RNG and I thought this time we talk a little bit about proxy contracts. So first, a little bit about myself, if you weren't here last time. Um, I'm a developer and, um, you know, so for a number of years I was working for Microsoft and then Amazon. So I was doing enterprise uh, development and development management. And then I dropped out to become a de game developer and that didn't work out. So ever since that didn't work out, uh, I've been focusing all of my time on crypto. And with that, uh, you know, I still have a passion for programming. So naturally, I just gravitated towards smart contracts. We've built probably eight different dApps, uh, little dApp games. Uh, one of the things that caught my attention the most was Nebulous was having a coding competition. And almost and everyone... Almost everyone... Oh, Echo. Oh, Echo. Let me uh, mute you. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so almost almost every one of them won a little bit of money, which was really exciting, but that got me um, going a lot deeper on how smart contracts work. And since then, I've only been doing it more and more. So very recently, I did a bounty uh, using Gitcoin for an upgradable smart contract. And that got me to dive into Zeppelin's uh, offering a lot. I also did a a bounty for Zeppelin directly. So between those two things, uh, I got exposed to their offering and I thought it was pretty interesting. And in addition, like ultimately what they're doing isn't very complicated and it's something that anyone is able to do. So proxies, um, what we're talking about here is allowing a contract to change its logic and or data at any point in the future. So normally, when you push out a smart contract, you expect immutability. You push it out, everybody can see the code, and you know that the owner of the contract or anybody else can't go in and modify something in the future. There's various different ways where the administrator of a smart contract can choose to give themselves levers in order to allow them control where they want it. Upgrading is the ultimate power. I'm talking specifically about Ethereum, yes. However, the concepts would apply to any other chain. I believe all of them have some sort of upgradable or proxy capability. Uh, most chains actually implement the EVM directly, so they would just support Solidity the same way that Ethereum does. And then others try to replicate that feature set. So I'm not positive, but I believe every chain would allow this kind of pattern to be here. And so it all started with the ability to proxy. And an example of proxy can be seen with CryptoKitties where they have an external contract in order to handle their uh, gene mixing logic. Um, that's kind of a simple case. So this is taking proxies to the extreme. And let me know if there's questions along the way. <laughs> I know this is kind of a complicated subject. So we're removing the mutability. And the way this works is by leveraging the fallback function in Solidity. Can someone explain what CryptoKitties is? CryptoKitties was one of the first successful dApp games on Ethereum. So it's a card collectible kind of experience where you have unique cats and you can trade those. But one of the things was you can uh, take two cats and breed them and make a baby. And the baby was unique depending on the parent's um, genetics. It produced a unique set of genetics. So that mixing process needed to be remain, uh, needed to remain secret. So I didn't mean to go into too much detail about CryptoKitties specifically, but that's just to point out a simple case of where proxies apply. Proxies ultimately uh, enable a lot of different scenarios. So it's kind of a nice feature that we have. But like I said, the upgrade is kind of taking this proxy capability to the extreme and it gives you ultimate control. So bottom line, and we'll talk more about how this works, but bottom line is if you have the ability to upgrade, you can do absolutely anything to the contract. One transaction could wipe all the data. I could change all the rules. I could overnight make it so instead of, you know, transferring the funds to where you expect them to go, you know, transfers to my wallet instead. Obviously, you know, people shouldn't be using it for that, but I wanted to start up front by pointing out that this completely removes the mutability promise that you normally get by deploying a smart contract. But sometimes that's worthwhile because 
Honestly, as a developer, the thought of trying to make an application that has no bugs the first time, put it out and never change it again? Are you kidding? <laughs> Who can do that? That's not realistic. So it's important, depending on what you're making, it may be a worthwhile trade-off. Now, on the blockchain, you still have some visibility. So one, when you're using a proxy, it's a little bit harder for people to follow, but you can still see the code that's pointing to. And more importantly, I can see every time someone tries to change it. So the owners have a lot of control and they can manipulate the logic, but at least I can see when they do that and how they use that power previously. And that might be some indication of how they use it in the future. Okay, so I linked an article at the beginning that kind of talks more detail about how this works, but there's uh, two main points that they make about what makes this possible. So the first is anytime you call a smart contract and you call a method name that doesn't exist, it ends up falling back to what they call the fallback function. The fallback function is normally what you use if you just want to accept money. So for example, there is, what do they call it? The self-drop service, if you know what self-drops are. Um, excuse me. So self-drop is um, a contract that's set up to do an airdrop, but instead of registering and having the ICO pay the gas in order to drop the tokens to people, they want people to pay their own gas. So that's the self-drop model. You end up just making a $0 trans, uh, transaction with the contract, and the contract sends you back tokens. And that's a way of making that end user pay the gas. Okay, so that's normally what that fallback function for. It is a function that has no method name, if you've seen Solidity development. Anytime, so like I was saying, anytime you call method name that doesn't exist in the contract, it ends up hitting that fallback function. And I can see what you were trying to call. So the point is, this is how we're able to intercept everything with a proxy. I can have just that fallback method implemented. And now anything you try to call, I know what your intent was. And that proxy is able to translate that and essentially forward it on to the actual implementation. So that's, that's where the second point comes in. There is the capability of delegating a call to another contract. And there's a couple of uh, implications of this. So a contract, simply put, what this means is a contract can call another contract. But it's a little bit more confusing than that because when I do this, the uh, contract that's making the call maintains the state. So what happens here is the proxy is calling the underlying implementation. And the proxy holds any information that that implementation modifies. So if we had an ERC-20 implementation and I wanted to make that upgradable, everybody interfaces with the ERC-20 through the proxy. So there, let me back up a second. This is, this is confusing. <clears throat> In order to deploy one of these, I end up making two contract deployments. One is a proxy contract that's deployed that has just that fallback implementation. Then I deploy the contract itself, which defines the V1 logic for the application. And I let the proxy contract know the address. Okay, so we have two contracts, the proxy and the V1 implementation. When someone uh, transacts the ERC-20, the data that we're talking about is your balance. Okay, so when we're going through the proxy, the user calls the proxy and the proxy forwards that call over to the V1 implementation. That V1 implementation defines the layout of the data and the logic. So what happens on a transfer? How do we record it and how is that stored? Now, the confusing part is with all of this, proxies holding the information. So proxy never declared the data structure. It saw how data was supposed to be structured from the V1 implementation. Now this is important because now we wanna to upgrade to V2. I deploy a V2 contract and I tell the proxy, now we're going to point to V2 instead. So this is nothing more than changing the address that it's forwarding calls to. However, the proxy contract itself didn't change. So the data storage didn't change, which means all the balances for anybody's ERC-20, well, that maintains. And with the V2 implementation, now we just have new logic. I fixed a bug. 
and I don't have to do any, uh, I don't have to do anything in order to make, uh, in order to do a token swap. Normally, in the case of an ERC-20, and we've seen this, I'm blanking on the name of who had to go through this recently, but someone had an issue where tokens were stolen or something like that. And the fix for it was uh, to deploy a new contract and then do a token swap from the old token to the new token. Or you could do something like snapshot at a period of time and deploy that to the new token. With upgradable contracts, I don't have to do any of that. The data is just right there. It's saved. It was never modified. It was never transferred. It always remained in proxy. And so long as V1 and V2 both acknowledge the data structure uh, the same, as long as um, like I can add new data with V2, but I can't modify anything from V1. If I did, it would get confused. So as just copy paste every uh, data piece, data structure that you had in V1, and then you can add more things to it in V2, as well as leverage all the existing information from V1. Does that make sense at all? <laughs> Questions? Kind of. So it's an interesting trade-off to make. Um, I'm currently, uh, I guess you could say, consulting with another project. And a question came up, should we make our contracts upgradable or not? And that's a really difficult question to answer. Because if it is upgradable, it begs the question a little bit, why, why are we using a blockchain? Didn't we lose, by losing immutability, didn't we lose a lot of the benefit that we get from blockchain? Uh, but on the other hand, like I was saying before, the thought of writing the perfect contract the first time is never going to happen. And who doesn't want to add features to any application or game over time? Locking yourself in right from the beginning, that's painful. And doing an upgrade, you know, the standard trustless way, that's painful too. And people could potentially lose data that way. So I feel like there's not really a good answer here. One of the benefits of using um, the, uh, the upgradable approach that you, like one of the benefits of being on a blockchain that you still get is the visibility. Like everyone can still go look at my code at any moment, see what version we're on, look that up and understand things. So that transparency I think is really important. And like I was saying before, you can see when someone modifies something. However, now I have to trust them that's the bottom line. I have to trust whoever deployed that contract is not going to do something malicious or it could be either malicious intent or just straight up a mistake, but they could change something that negatively impacts me. So how much can I trust? How much can I really invest or whatever it may be, interact with that contract, knowing that I have to fully trust the company that's deploying it? Imagine the dollar one. <laughs> yeah. Well, they can do whatever they want now, so what would that change? <laughs> if an organization is thinking about using an upgradable smart contract, one thing that, that came up when I was um, doing the bounty, doing this for another group, is I think it's really, really important that you acknowledge this concern that I raise. And one way to acknowledge that and to mitigate it is to make the proxy owner um, a multi-sig contract. There should be no single set of private keys that can do something potentially so catastrophic. Multiple people should be involved. There's no one person that you can trust with this kind of control. So set up a multi-sig, which means anytime you want to perform an upgrade, there's several people that, for whatever reason, are trusted to participate in the process. Several people have to give an approval saying, this is what we want to do. That significantly lowers the risks of a mistake being made or someone having their keys compromised and something malicious happening. Make it immutable enough that you need con network consensus to upgrade. Network consensus is a really difficult and expensive thing to achieve. 
So if you actually want to do consensus, the, the one common way of doing that is simply by vote. But if you don't have a large percent of the population participating in the vote, then it can very easily be manipulated. So if you wanted to, to suggest something like that, yeah, no, I know you're kidding, but I'm just running with it. If you wanted to suggest something like that, um, like you need to ensure that you're only considering contracts that have a very wide population impacted, if that makes sense. Otherwise, you know, one side or another is just going to buy the answer that they're looking for. It is in theory possible, but participation just wouldn't be there. I mean, EOS wasn't exactly trying to do that, but that was kind of part of their promise. And it didn't take long for them to realize that this doesn't scale. If you give them a channel, people are going to complain all the time. And how, <laughs> how can you keep up? can always fork. Yeah, but that's terrible for smart contracts, right? You want to fork? You want to fork Ethereum because one contract screwed up? Yeah. Okay. I I know, I know. But that's not something we should be considering in the future. It's crazy. So, that kind of raises the point that maybe one thing that I strongly believe in uh, for scalability is using side chains, multiple different chains. I don't believe that we're ever going to achieve mass adoption with any primary on-chain scaling solution. So this kind of begs the point that maybe what you're talking about uh, with using network consensus, if we have enough small um, uh, side chains, like one of the things that Cardano suggested as an example, is maybe we have side chains such as side chain for gambling where all the gambling dApps participate in the same sidechain, and that's separate from other sidechains. Now you're creating these little ecosystems, and the thought of getting uh, network consensus, getting people to participate, actually might work. It sounds unsustainable by having too many sidechains. It's a way of scaling. So normally with a blockchain, you don't get additional throughput in any way by adding additional participants. Using sidechains allows you additional throughput with more participants. It's one scaling solution that I think can be incredibly effective, but it's really confusing for people. So more sidechains? Well, yeah, I, the, a big part of the proposal was using more sidechains, but they were um, trying to tease out some additional benefit that we, we might get from dedicated sidechains. So I don't think they mean to say every smart every gambling smart contract would be on that same dApp. Um, if the scale got, got large enough to warrant it, maybe that splits into several sidechains. Um, it was more to say by bringing uh, related dApps together, there might be some common requirements that make sense. And specifically the reason that Cardano raised it was not for what we were discussing. They were thinking in terms of KYC. So they could set up a side chain dedicated to gambling and say every transaction requires KYC in order to participate. That's something that you could do at a network consensus level. Anybody on the gambling chain has to go through KYC. It makes sense. Any other questions? You're wel welcome to hop on the voice chat as well if anybody has something. Okay, well, I guess that is all I have. I'm sorry it was so short. Um, I, I didn't prepare additional topics to cover unless you guys have something else that you want to jump into. Uh, it's hard to prepare 
a full hour um, when it's just me talking. <laughs> What's my background? So um, I kicked off with that a little bit. Uh, I used to work for Microsoft and then Amazon. So 10 years working enterprise. And then I hopped into game development and that didn't work out for me. So um, that, that failed a few months ago. Uh, well, well, like 10 months ago. It's been a while, I guess. Uh, ever since then, I've been 100% crypto and uh, still focused on smart contracts. So as of recently, my focus is doing bounties, which is what actually got me introduced to Zeppelin and then their upgradable uh, capabilities. So Gitcoin is the site that I've been focused on. Uh, there's not a ton of work listed there, but I'm having good results so far. <laughs> Thank you. I do stream daily on Twitch as well under the name Hardly Difficult, and we post a, a daily news video to uh, YouTube. Most of the time, my streams are coding things. So recently, uh, I've been working on Decentraland tutorials. Decentraland is, you know, an upcoming metaverse, they call it. Um, it's going to be where you buy a plot of land with crypto, and you own that, and you can do anything that you want with it. And then people in the world physically, I mean, well, virtual, physical, like they walk around. So... Proximity really matters, and districts are going to be set up, things like that. So otherwise, uh, Decentraland is kind of a VR experience. It's, a, it's a, like a game that you can walk through. They'll support VR as well as an in-browser experience. And we've been working on getting basic scenes up and running and uh, creating tutorials for that. So I spent all day recording a Decentraland tutorial today. <laughs> That'll be coming out tomorrow. Is there censorship? That's an excellent question. So that's certainly a concern. What if you want like a kid-friendly district? How do you do that if anybody can do anything they want with their land? Well, their plan for that is actually uh, going to be third-party solutions. And there could also be a token curated registry that solves the problem. But it comes down to it's a whitelist. If you want to be able to ensure that the content is clean or family-friendly, then there'll be a third party provider of a whitelist and they'll make sure that all the land that you can see is up to snuff. So if you want to let your kids participate, you set up a whitelist that says everything is family friendly and um, they don't want like Decentraland, the company to own that. This is it's third party provided so that it can scale and remain a decentralized solution. One thing when we're working with crypto, since we're talking about Decentraland a little bit, is they're decentralized, decentralized in a very different way than we normally think of. So it's not like smart contracts executing all the experiences. It's about ownership. So they don't have the ability to revoke land ownership. Anybody can buy it and deploy anything they want there. When you deploy something, you're actually just providing a pointer to content on IPFS, and then the client can download and interact with it there. From there, the provider of the land can do anything that they want. So if they wanted to do something like a trustless smart contract game executed on the blockchain, but visualized in this little plot of land, they can do that. However, if they also wanted to run a completely centralized casino where they, they own you know, everything about that experience and could potentially manipulate the odds behind the scenes, that's also possible. So I like to think of it as distributed more than decentralized. But I mean, ultimately it is both. It's just with decentralized, you often think of that trust factor that you get from smart contracts, the people that, the fact that everybody can see the code, audit the code, um, and so on. That's not something that you're guaranteed to get in this world, but it leaves for incredible flexibility. So now you're opening it up and there's actually a lot of things that you could do. I have no idea what this is going to be like, and I have a feeling there's still a long ways from having a product that they can launch, but it should be interesting. 
In theory, it's a little bit like Second Life. Do I know any competitors? Well, Second Life is one, and then the company behind Second Life is working on um, a new experience as well. So that right there is a major competitor. Uh, beyond that, I'm not sure of any. Um, a little bit similar is Engine. So Engine is talking about their metaverse now, and, and specifically what they're thinking are people with 1155s are going to create uh, shareable content. So in theory, w the article today mentioned that you'll be able to have like a legendary sword and have that sword respected by multiple different games. Now that's just multiple games working behind the scenes to agree to leverage content that came from someone else's game. Now that kind of thing is getting this, this intertwined experience between games that you know, wasn't there before, and it sounds really compelling. That's part of what Decentraland's trying to achieve. Now, Engine's not talking about, like, physically putting games next to each other in a world that you have to walk around in. But they are talking about, you know, encouraging more interaction between games. So that's along the same lines. It's nothing special about Engine. Well, so, I mean, we're talking generally about open source stuff. So in general, you could say that about a lot of these groups. Now that said, not everybody is open source, but Engine is pushing this stuff open source. So when we're talking about the 1155 and the ability for uh, games to share content between them, um, no, you don't need Engine for that. However, I'd also like to point out that Engine, the company, also gets absolutely nothing for it. There's no profit built in for them. They deployed a standard and they're trying to get people to leverage the standard and these interactions and stuff. I think the benefit that they get is it's, it's creating marketing, it's creating buzz and interest in their offering. There's no direct benefit to Engine. But since you mentioned it, Loom is doing amazing things as well. They really have a focus on doing side chains in a way that I think is very reasonable. They recently put out that article talking about the third layer solution. I was just talking about how second layer solution side chains is very important. Third layer is where it's at. Oh my God, I can't wait. I can't wait to see what that's like. Now, the, the net net benefit of it is we're talking about 100% free transactions, right? To the user, that's what matters. The fact that you can interact with this without paying money, without approving a whole bunch of transactions and waiting a lot of time. It's fast and free until the point that you want to settle up with the main chain. So like if I was playing a card game and I was just trying it out, you can give me a couple free packs and I can get a bunch of crap bullshit cards and I can test out the game and then walk away and no nobody loses anything really. Or I could end up opening a legendary, realize that someone's willing to pay me 50 bucks for it and decide to settle up with Ethereum so I can secure that on something that has a higher level of security. By bringing it back to Ethereum, it's now locked into my account on something that is more hardened than a sidechain. In theory, you don't get the same security with the sidechain, but by eventually settling up with the main chain, you inherit all those properties again. So get a good card, lock it in. <laughs> They're the first decent implementation of Plasma. Well, Plasma is doing really cool stuff. Uh, so I hope, I hope that's something that we see explode. Like I'm okay if there's 50 implementations that come out. Um, I think the hardest part is gonna be, how do we explain this stuff to the users? How do you, how do you walk them through this process, right? You can't, you can't use a word like Plasma Cache. <laughs> the fuck you talking about? <laughs> and side chains you can't say that main chain even i mean even using the word ethereum is pretty questionable really hard if you want to get everyday people to use it and you have to reach the balance because some people are interested i mean it's a marketing opportunity for games but simply by using blockchain in some way that's a marketing side of things. So you want to let people know that you are. But on the other hand, if you want normal people to participate, you need to abstract away as much as that as you can. Yeah, the zombie stuff. Like, I can't wait to try the alpha of that, right? 
So Loom's trying to solve that problem. So that that's what I that's one of the things I want to see most is how they handle the on ramp and off ramp, even more than the game. The game looks neat, kind of like a Hearthstone clone, but you know it looks pretty neat. I'm I'm more interested in the tech and the user experience that they present. So how do you get started, and and when you do want to settle up, how do you go through that process? Have you actually tried it? I thought it was private alpha. Is there something public? No. Okay. 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 Sounded your comments made it sound like you you had. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. But sounds exciting. All right. Well, thanks again. I appreciate you guys stopping by. Maybe I'll see you next week.